Integral Revolver. Blow a hole straight through their long-winded theories. What's up? I am David Long. I'm sharing a clip from a podcast that I worked on with my friend Andrew Waite. We never did quite figure out the format. We might try again at a future date, but in the meantime, I just wanted to share a clip with you. This first voice coming up is going to be Andrew. I hope you enjoy. You want to understand what the witness is in Buddhism. You don't need decades and decades and decades to pursue this. And the thing no. is, if, you're, if the concept, if the view of what you're pursuing is incorrect, then yeah, it's going to take you a long time to try and, and you're going to miss the mark over and over. So. And it's also, I think, part of that green performative self-contradiction. You know, it's like, who wants enlightenment so bad? And who is so afraid that they won't get it? Who has all that fear and desire and thinks it's like their social duty to be enlightened? The ego. This is so they're like assuming all these postures and wondering why it's not happening for them. Because yeah. their ego is like so hard invested in it. I was at the Boulder Integral Center a couple days ago and I heard these two people talking about enlightenment. I actually heard several people talking about enlightenment and the emphasis seemed to be very much on the experience. I even heard this one lady say that her ultimate goal in life was awakening. It's like, okay, and then what? So you awaken, what are you awakening to? Absolute unity and interconnectedness or something like that is what I would say you're awakening to, to some extent, if you're really awakening. And then and then what? How can your absolute goal just be to realize what has always already been? Sure. Like that's got to be a means to a higher end. Otherwise, it's what is it good for? Sure, sure. What I think happens a lot of the time, even when you and I might hear something like this, and we're like, okay, it's integral. And so it just, we let it pass. So what happens is, is that we read in our transrational interpretation and it's not necessarily even the perspective of the person who's talking. If you listen to them longer, if you hear more of what they have to say, you'll figure out that they're actually talking about some pre-rational stuff, and we were just giving them the benefit of the doubt. I think that happens a lot. It's confusing because there is a lot of, again, more of that theme of bad integration, of far-sighted mishmashing, still not being able to see and appreciate the differences, but kind of acting like, ah, all these idealistic things are basically saying the same shit. So I think that for some of them, they think that if they take out some of the mean judgy stuff and still believe in some of the literal concept of God stuff, it's okay because their God isn't mean and judgy anymore. He's an all loving, intelligent creator who has a plan for you and wants you to. So it's like all the nice bits without any of the hard stuff. I don't know. It does. It does. It feels like at a certain point, they're just trying to sneak their bullshit back in through the back door. Like a lot of these philosophers, backdoor Christians have done in the past. They go, oh, it's it's all true? Well, good. I really like this one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead of understanding that they're all true poetically, there's a un there are universal things being talked about, but they're also all not true. And you have to get that too. None of them are the absolute truth, but they all have like a poetic piece of the truth. And honestly, you know, I, I think when it comes to some of these traditions, you have to realize that people in Jesus's time with finger quotes <laughs> and in Buddha's time. This is 2,000, 2,500 years ago before we had microscopes and telescopes. And their way to get people to realize that we're all interconnected in this big picture kind of way is like way over everybody's head. But now in the year 2016, it's a scientific fact. You have every single one of your favorite scientists on that song of the Symphony of Science. If you if you Google that, you know, you have Neil deGrasse Tyson and Carl Sagan and Bill Nye and all these dudes on there talking about the interconnectedness of us all. We're all connected to each other biologically, to the Earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. I think nature's a I kind of feel like, even though I do like some Buddhist poetry and some of this kind of stuff, that in a way, a lot of the times, that kind of poetry actually creates more confusion than it does clarity because the symbols are so outdated, because there's so much muck for it to get caught up in. If you can't talk about it in plain language, then you probably don't have too much business talking about it in those old school religious symbols. You've got to be able to break it down into regular terms. When you look at like a number of people outside of like Wilbur, outside of integral philosophy, there's a perspective that the interpretation of those symbols has been lost. Like that the problem isn't that they don't communicate with us. You're like apt to notice for sure they're derived from a much earlier structure of consciousness. And so it's going to be, like you said before, there were telescopes and microscopes. So it's going to be based upon an interpretation that is in some sense outdated at the same time. There's a gap in the ability to understand the connotations of those symbols. 
like even if they are previous to us, I get the feeling that we have some effort to do to accurately evolve through those previous kind of like amber particularly stages of religious development. You can see to some extent the way in which you almost see law as this universal bidding, like the direction of some universal driver. And there's a way that you do that for, I mean, temporarily. I think it's somehow easily transcended and, and it's not really as important today. And especially in Buddhism, you see like a lot of the teachings are coming from this place where you have like a guru who has the rules who is interested in you being keen on their lineage you know like not necessarily buddhism as a whole but like the lineage it's even specifically and it makes sense because it's an oral transmission in a lot of ways and part of the thing is like you can't capture the meaning of the teaching in in words and symbols so easily so like it, it's like taught in this much more complex way yeah and if you really understand what Buddha's enlightenment is in the context of his story, in the context of his tradition. Like, not only do you have to root it in reaction to Hinduism, because it is, you know, that's where Buddha's worldview is. So his Buddhism is in, is in reaction to Hinduism. So you have to understand Hinduism to really understand Buddhism. If you see what he's doing in his story, that he's trying to teach the way to have this experience. So Buddhism is Mahayana, Hinayana. These are ferry boats. These are supposed to be a set of practices that will give you an experience to help you have this realization. But you don't need to do that to have that realization. And now, in the year 2016, doing all that might actually wind up infusing you, giving you more cultural conditioning that really to be truly awake and truly free, you might have to transcend and include, right? And might leave you more confused about the nature of reality than if you would have taken on science as a mystery tradition. So are you saying that the aspect of enlightenment that one would experience upon fulfillment of a Buddhist path gets molded by the cultural context of the Buddhist dialogue that surrounds it, so the enlightenment experience is occurring through a certain lens? Yep. It colors it, it distorts it, mm -hmm. and it frames it in terms of Hindu idealism. Like, for example, you know, this idea of going back to source or nirvana Nervo, Nervi, Kalpa, Samadhi, we know that those NIR pretexts mean without nothing. It's all rooted in Hindu creation mythology. The Buddha, he drank from that golden bowl with all the nourishment, right? And he threw it in the river. And he says, if the bowl goes upstream against the flow of life, then I will achieve enlightenment. And even his temptations towards the end are the going backwards of the creation myth. Because in the beginning, there was this being of beings who was all that there was. After infinitudes of nothingness, out of nowhere, this nothing said the word I. Then it felt afraid and was like, oh, wait, it's only me. Then it was like, it felt desire. It's like, I wish it wasn't only me. And so in Buddhism, you go backwards. You get rid of desire, which cancels out fear, which cancels out I, and gets you back to this kind of nothingness consciousness before the Big Bang. So Buddhism is itself framed in terms of this idealistic Hindu creation myth. And when you believe in that kind of an awakening, to some extent, you have taken on this Hindu idealistic frame through which to see the world. And that is a distortion of reality because it's rooted in this view from thousands of years ago, and it's ethnocentric. And really, Hinduism, just like the Abrahamic tradition, if you really study it, we think, oh, these traditions are so beautiful, but their caste system is basically racism cemented in time. And it's offensive, not only in terms of the idea of you're born in this caste, so that's what you're going to be and do your duty, but it's also offensive to the Western aesthetic because it cancels out any idea of individuality. Your goal in Hinduism is to take on the, the caste and the dharma of what you're supposed to be doing and become transparent to it never add anything to it. I mean, this is, a, this is a culture that's frozen in time and is definitely not in touch with evolution. So trying to freeze racism that's built into their cultural structure, that's what all this reincarnation and dharma and karma is all about. So like, you know, when Ken Wilbur and stuff are like, oh, maybe reincarnation is beautiful. I'm wondering, like, do you know anything at all about this tradition? Have you studied the history? Or are you just looking at poetry and going, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, this is nice. It's so nice. Like, you have to really understand these things in terms of the cultures that they come from. Yeah, yeah. What happens is, especially if you're coming from a Christian tradition, it's easy to see all the horrors in the Abrahamic tradition and to be like, oh, this is fucked up. And then be like, oh, Buddhism. Oh, so beautiful. 
<laughs> you know, and not see all the horrible fucked up things that are in that culture because it's so opposite and so alien to us. It's the, the antithesis in many ways.